Welcome to the Election Protection Call. My name is Jackie and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Elizabeth Howard. Center, Liz, you may begin. Thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today to discuss our new report, Ensuring Safe Elections, which provides an analysis of the estimated COVID-19 related election administration costs facing election officials in the following five states, Georgia, Michigan, Missouri, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. It's a pleasure to be on the call today with my Brennan Center colleague and co-author, Derek Tisler, and the other report co-authors who represent an ideologically diverse group of organizations. And most importantly, multiple election officials who also represent a diverse range of views, some of whom just held an election less than 48 hours ago, and some of who are currently working to navigate the many challenges facing them and their voters as they prepare for elections in the upcoming months in this November. Even though the states we profile in this report represent diverging election administration systems and needs from the number of elections, for example, Georgia may have five elections this cycle, to their requirements for absentee voting, we identified two common themes. First, Congress has provided what Congress has provided to our election officials to run elections in a pandemic does not come close to what's needed for healthy and safe elections in 2020. In fact, the aggregated estimated costs in these five states alone are greater than the $400 million Congress allocated for the entire country. Second, local election officials bear the heaviest burden for protecting voters, poll workers, and other staff during these elections. They are responsible for the majority of the estimated costs in all the states we examined, even where state officials have voluntarily assumed additional costs and responsibilities. We urge Congress to listen to our election officials and ensure that they get the funding they desperately need in the next stimulus package. I look forward to your questions, and I'm now going to hand this over to Paul Rosenzweig, Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute and Report Co-Author. Hi, thank you very much, Liz. This is Paul Rosenzweig at the R Street Institute. Uh, I am proud and pleased to be a co-author of this report. Uh, It reflects, I think, two important salient points. Uh, The first of those is that nobody should be facing the choice of their health or exercising the franchise in the coming election. And that means we need to prepare now for providing all Americans an opportunity to cast their ballot in new and novel ways that are different from our traditional methodology of lining up at the polling booth and casting a ballot. To be sure, some people will continue to do that, but for many Americans, this will require a change in how they vote. And it's fundamental that Congress support that because, from my perspective at least, It ought to be common ground amongst all parties and all participants in the electoral process that allowing every American who wants to vote the opportunity to do so is the bedrock of fundamental American freedom. And then the second point is that achieving that goal is going to cost money. Uh, Regretfully, our states don't have enough to do the job that we're about to give them in this new and changing emergent world. But that should not be a barrier to effective operations. We spend more than $6 billion a year buying toilet paper. I believe that Congress has an an obligation to assist the state in acting in a way that allows them to provide every American an opportunity to vote. Our report today details some of those, those obligations, some of those new cost centers that are going to arise, and it is... Uh, important that Congress, when it comes back, uh, address this directly and immediately in new and different ways and provide the funding that's necessary. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Liz. Thank you for letting me uh, address everybody. Thank you very much, Paul. Next, we're going to go to David Levine, the Elections Integrity Fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Thanks, David. So David's probably on mute. We will um, next go over to Chris Deluzio, 
the policy director at the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Cyber Law Policy and Security. Thanks, Liz, and thanks to all who are on. I'm Chris Deluzio from Pitt Cyber. Uh, I, I wanted to stress how much I think that our state and local officials here in Pennsylvania and, frankly, across the country right now are facing a profound challenge to our democracy during this public health crisis, something none of us have seen in our lifetimes, at least. But working to keep voters safe, to keep poll workers and election staff safe, while also being called on to execute free, fair, secure, and accessible elections is a Herculean task for these folks, these public servants. And what I hope and I think this report makes clear, it was driven by the election officials consulted, is that these state and local governments need a massive infusion of resources, and they need it now. In Pennsylvania in particular, and much of this financial burden is going to fall on our counties, which are really the ones who administer elections in our state. But Pennsylvania is not unique in this. This is a national crisis, demands national action to protect our elections, and the Congress, the White House, the federal government really need to step up now with more funding for the states and the local officials who run and administer so much of our elections. The stakes here are too high for our democracy to choose an action. I urge our federal government to do so now and do so soon. So with that, Liz, I'll say thanks and turn it back to you. Many thanks, Chris. Um, we are now going to hear from the multiple election officials that are on our call um, we are going to start with Ricky Hatch, the auditor and clerk in Weaver County, Utah, um, who is also um, the representative of the National Association of Counties today. Ricky, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Liz. Uh, as she said, I am the elected clerk auditor for Weaver County in Utah. We have about 110,000 active registered voters, and with a population of about 260,000 people, we are in the top 10% largest counties in the nation. Now, with that population, my elections team is made up of three full-time employees. To compare, Weber County is two and a half times larger than the average county in the United States. Seventy percent of counties in the U.S. have a population less than 50,000, and over half of the counties in the U.S. have fewer than 27,000 people. And elections is just one-third of my job. Now, fortunately, I have three excellent employees who can administer the elections, but what about a small county who has one employee or even half an employee and who also processes marriage licenses, tax appeals, you know, keeping records, or even HR? County clerks always make do with what we have, but with this pandemic, we need help. In Weber County, we anticipate additional costs of about a dollar per voter because of COVID-19. Now, this might seem low, but keep in mind, over 90% of voters in Utah already vote by mail. So we're actually in a pretty good position. Uh, in our county, we'll have a single drive through polling place for in-person voters, and we still need to buy cleaning equipment, signage, label printers, tents, fans, voter education, personal protective equipment, generators, and a lot of other items. Now, I can only imagine the costs for counties who aren't already vote-by-mail, whether they're either switching to vote-by-mail or whether they need to protect in-person voters, including protecting and recruiting poll workers whose average age is 65. Now, the cost estimates for the five states listed in the press release exceed $400 million for just those states. For those states, between 70 to 80 percent of the total costs are borne by the counties. The overwhelming majority of elections in this country are administered at a local level by a local entity, not by a state. States are essential and helpful partners, but counties administer our country's elections, including Congress, and the Office of President. Now, I realize beggars can't be choosers, but when it comes to federal assistance, we're begging that you let us choose to use these resources in the way that best fits our unique needs. With a population of over 10 million, what Los Angeles County needs is not the same as what Scotland County, Missouri needs, population 5,000. If federal funds come with strings, many counties simply won't be able to use those funds because their state and local laws might actually prohibit implementation of those strings. Also, while the need for elections funding is crucial at the state level, most of it really should go directly to the counties and cities who bear 70 to 80 percent of the cost of elections. Sending assistance directly to counties helps ensure it doesn't get stuck at the state level. Now, local government is consistently more trusted by the public than state or federal government, and that seems right because we're neighbors and friends. They know us and they trust us. So let's put the money where the need is and where the trust is. 
Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Ricky. Now we're going to pass this over to Tina Barton, the city clerk in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Liz. I am the city clerk in the city of Rochester Hills, Michigan. Our state has over 7.5 million voters. Uh, we are a very decentralized state where we have over 1,500 clerks that are cities and township clerks that are administering the elections here. Uh, in the current situation that we are in, uh, the Rochester Hills budget in the annual operating budget is 50 million. Uh, we have taken a $7 million hit to our local budget uh, from the COVID crisis. The city of Detroit is just south of us, and Mayor Duggan has stated that COVID will cost their budget uh, just under $350 million over the next 16 months. Our city has 55,000 registered voters, 32 precincts. I hire three to 400 people for large elections. When I consider what it would look like if we were to go either a total vote at home or a precinct voting and absentee voting uh, as we currently do, um, I have to consider the following uh, items that the average age of an election worker in Michigan is over 70 years old, a high-risk category. As I look at precinct voting, I would have to look at training three to 400 people with social distancing in mind. Currently, our auditorium has a capacity of 150, but with social distancing, it allows a capacity of 17. How would we conduct classes and how would we train our election workers to fall within these restrictions? We're looking at costs to supplies to keep things clean at, at precincts, like hand sanitizers, masks, wipes, et cetera, for 32 different locations. I would need to hire one person at each precinct just to keep things wiped down in between voters as they are coming through to vote. We would probably have to look at offering more pay in order to incentivize people to even work during a pandemic. Where would we place precincts that are currently in assisted living homes, senior clubhouses, and churches? Are we going to tell churches that we are allowed to have our precincts there when they're not allowed to have their services there? Things that we have to consider. When we look at vote at home challenges, where would you place an absentee counting board that large in a local community? Again, our council auditorium has a max capacity right now of 17. I have to consider the cost of mailing 55,000 applications to all of my registered voters. Not only that, but also the cost then of turnaround and mailing 55,000 ballots. Uh, we typically see somewhere just under a 90% turnout. So to see a number of 50,000 ballots would not be highly unlikely for us. We're looking at the cost of return postage of 50,000 ballots, at least $25,000 hit to our budget. The cost of purchasing envelopes to mail all those ballots, as well as purchasing return envelopes for those ballots. The cost of purchasing instructions to be placed in the secrecy envelopes, which also would have to be an additional cost for that many. The cost of machines that we're going to need to process the increase in ballots, like high-speed letter openers, high-speed tabulators, scanners for barcodes on these ballots and on the application, additional ballot drop boxes that might need to be purchased to place, be placed throughout our communities. The cost of purchasing items like UV ray lights to run over the ballots that are returned on election day to help kill off any viruses that might be living on the surface. The cost of paying staff overtime to process thousands of absentees the cost of hiring more staff to help with the increased numbers, and they have to be staff who can be trained on the voter database to help issue and receive on ballots. The huge cost of communicating with our voters that their voting process has changed. This will require multiple information pieces on various platforms. Additionally, other costs come to mind, like purchasing a deli-style take-a-number system because voters will not be able to stand close by our counter. They will need to take a number and be called up in a safe manner. We will have to establish a second area processing voters on election day for same day registration that we have here in Michigan. Some Michigan clerks processed several hundred same day registrations on election day in the March presidential primary. We have considered purchasing a large tent and placing it outside to help process voters in a safe manner. Most city halls aren't meant to hold large numbers of people at a time, let alone spacing them apart. Storage costs for storing thousands of applications and thousands of ballots. We are already pricing portable shelving and bins that can be used to store these items and to help keep them organized. We're pricing out the purchasing of more tables. If we have to spread members of our team out, we're going to need more tables in order to be able to do that. In the meantime, as a city clerk, I also oversee three cemeteries and we're burying at high numbers. We're processing death certificates. We're still processing FOIA requests. I'm still handling city administrative functions for my city council. All of these things are coming at us still. We're still doing our jobs. And although we're in uncertain times, 
One thing I want to make sure that is certain to all of you is that as election officials, we are resolved to carrying on with our mission, our mission of providing free, fair, and accessible elections across this great country. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, next, we're going to go to Shane Scholler, the county clerk in Greene County, Missouri, and the second vice president for the Missouri Association of County Clerks and Election Authorities. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Liz. Um, Abraham Lincoln said elections belong to the people. Every year, public servants honor men and women who have given their lives to protect our freedom as they eloquently and passionately make these points again and again during memorial and Veterans Day ceremonies all over the country. Of these freedoms, we know we hold dear and consider the right to vote paramount to the foundational strength of our country. For example, since the ratification of our Constitution, citizens have strengthened that foundation by passing the 15th, 19th, 24th, and 26th Amendments, every one of which has either protected or expanded the right to vote. Because we live in a constitutional republic, the conversation about how best to protect the right to vote will always be an ongoing conversation. It's a conversation that brings forth deep and passionate convictions by citizens of very different political convictions. Today, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing those raw emotions play out on the public stage as citizens and policymakers debate how best to protect this deeply held right, while at the same time protecting citizens' health when they go to cast a vote. There are common sense proposals that, of course, are going to come with a cost that we should consider. I do want to articulate, because some people have tried to turn this conversation into a um, idea that we are asking to become an all-mail ballot um, system in our nation, and that is not what this conversation is about. I think it's important that we keep this um, current of the conversation. And the um, proposals that I support that are being discussed um, are specific to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, it's an issue that affects a large number of voters, including many of their high-risk categories that are concerned. They will not be able to safely cast their ballot and protect their health. And I continue to hear from them because they are concerned how they will be able to safely cast their vote in light of COVID-19. As a county clerk, I'm duty-bound to listen to those concerns. And as a fellow human being, I feel compelled to be conscientious to them. For example, here in Greene County, we have 160,000 active registered voters. With inactive voters, we have 190,000 voters. We have 80 precincts, point locations. And we had to postpone our April election to June 2nd in light of COVID-19. The cost that we have um, estimated just for November alone for just staffing, which includes um, staffing on Election Day, prior to Election Day, um, has increased by an amount of $74,250 just in order to be able to keep up with the staffing costs. The per personal protective equipment would be a minimum cost of $20,145 um, for our county. Um, training, we will be looking, um, as Tina mentioned, going to a very different system that will be e-learning. That will take a large amount of time and effort in order to be able to admit that. Uh, implement that on an administrative um, point of view. And then we also um, are looking at um, how do we process the election. So Tina mentioned high-speed scanners. We're looking at one of those. The minimum cost for that would be $50,000 um, just to be able to purchase a high-speed scanner because we would anticipate that um, more people will be voting by absentee. Missouri is currently an excuse absentee state. There's um, no um, excuse in the state of Missouri currently that applies directly to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are approaching our legislature for changes to that. But I anticipate that voters, regardless of the excuses, will be by, um, voting by absentee ballot um, in higher uh, volume than normal. And so we are prepared for that and want to make sure that we can process the election on the night of the election um, smoothly and efficiently and, of course, um, because of the administrative burdens and the cost to be able to do that, um, we see that being significant. And so the bottom line is that we received from the Secretary of State through the most recent round of federal appropriations from Congress $150,000 for a county. We anticipate just for November the total cost would be $180,142 for a difference of 30142 And so we are grateful for the money that has been for 
set forth by Congress to be able to help in this time. But clearly, we have to continue having this conversation on behalf of the voters. Um, as I tell folks, as county clerk, and I think each of the election authorities on this call would tell you, they swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the laws and constitution of their state. It's an oath that we take seriously, both in our personal conduct and as we administer the duties of the office. And so it's imperative in the conduct of the election, especially in light of integrity and the issues that we are facing with COVID-19, that we do all we can to be able to ensure that when the voters come to cast their ballot either in person or make the decision they need to be able to cast their ballot absentee, that they can do it safely and securely. And that's why we're looking um, at the um, additional funding to be able to help make sure that occurs because um, if we don't have that funding, it will create significant challenges and we risk, um, unfortunately, I believe, losing confidence um, in our voters in terms of the election system by which they cast their ballot, and we cannot afford to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, next, we go to Michelle Wilcox, who is the president of the Ohio Elections Officials Association and the Auglaize County Board of Elections Director. Thank you for joining the call, Michelle. Thank you for having me. Um, again, I am Michelle Wilcox, and I'm the director here in Auglaize County and also the president of our state association. In Ohio, we have approximately 7.5 million registered voters. And also, our local officials are responsible for the majority of the additional costs and responsibilities associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Total costs facing Ohio are between 66 and $78 million, which are $12.8 million allocated out of the $400 million only represents 16 to 18 percent of total of our estimated costs. When the General Assembly passed the COVID-19 House Bill 197, our state of elections um, officials immediately thought and planned for the physical and manual aspects of implementing an all-male election April 28th in just 30 short days. But never in our minds in that moment were we thinking of the physical or the fiscal aspects. Imagine some of our Ohio counties using a ballot marking system and they don't have physical uh, paper ballots on hand. Mercer County, which is a neighboring county of mine, had to order 30,000 paper ballots and have them to use and mail out within a couple days. Supplies. In a like election four years ago, our county had 464 absentee mail ballots. This primary, we sent over 6,265. In Licking County, which is a medium-sized county with approximately 118,000 registered voters, they spent over $15,000 just in overtime. And with postage and supplies, each ballot they sent cost around $5 each. 30,000 voters requested an absentee, and it cost them $150,000. Imagine if their 70% voter turnout um, request in November, that would cost his medium county $413,000. In um, Cuyahoga County, who when the election was extended, spent $44,000 just delivering equipment and getting it back and when it wasn't even used. Um, in Warren County, um, they have spent over $80,000 in postage with just a 29% turnout. Again, imagine the cost of postage for a 70 to 90% turnout. So um, we need federal funding immediately to cover the cost that we've already used most of our funds for this fiscal year. 
So what I am asking is that we get federal funding to help cover the cost and to make sure that we will be able to operate in November. And from going, it takes most states three years to incorporate an all-male election, and Ohio did it, and my fellow colleagues, in 30 days. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, next, we'll go to Lisa Welch, who is the first vice president of the Ohio Association of Election Officials and the Holmes County Board of Elections Director. Thank you for joining the call, Lisa. We might have lost Lisa. Um, I think we have uh, David Levine, who is um, back on the phone. David, can you um, provide a couple of comments and wrap us up? Liz, I'd be happy to. Sorry about that earlier. Um, hi, I'm David Levine. I'm the Election Integrity Fellow for the Alliance for Securing Democracy. As others have mentioned, right, we always knew that the 2020 election cycle was going to include more stressors than usual. On top of the expected challenges election officials face, such as making sure all eligible voters are able to cast ballots, voters and election officials are now um, voters and election officials are now uh, more than ever aware of foreign interference in the coronavirus in relation to our elections process. In November 2019, the heads of federal federal agencies stated that in the 2020 election cycle. Russia, China, Iran, and other foreign malicious actors all would seek to interfere in the voting process or influence voter perception. Adversaries may try to accomplish their goals through a variety of means, including social media campaigns, directing disinformation operations, or conducting disruptive or destructive cyber attacks on state and local infrastructure. And in case those challenges weren't enough, we are now facing an unprecedented global health crisis that has left some Americans in the position of having to choose between protecting their health and participating in our democracy, a crisis that our adversaries could exploit to try and further undermine democracies around the world, including ours. In the wake of COVID-19, Congress gave states $400 million in March to help administer elections. And this was a first step, but more is needed. As this report lays out, the contrast between what state and local election officials need in five states to run safe and secure elections during the COVID-19 pandemic and what Congress has provided so far is stark. It's not a pretty picture, but Americans and their representatives need to see it. Without further funding, there is a real risk that COVID-19 could impede Americans' ability to cast ballots and have them count. Thank you so much, David. Um, we have Lisa Welch on the line with us. Um, again, she is the first vice president of the Ohio Association of Election Officials and the Holmes County Board of Elections Director. Thank you for joining the call, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm Lisa Welch from Holmes County Board of Elections in Ohio. Um, we're a very small county. We have approximately 17,055 voters, 17 precincts. We plan to have 76 poll workers at each election, training an extra 12 is generally enough. This election, we trained 30 additional poll workers as we lost over half of our poll workers in the days leading up to the election because most of our poll workers are over age 60 and we're concerned about the issues. Um, all of our smaller boards of elections are staffed by a deputy and director that are of opposite parties. We do a bipartisan teamwork, but most of the small boards don't have more than that. It's just two people. Occasionally, the, the small board of election may be a little larger and have two other full-time staff. We worked um, with seasonal help this time, and our part-time help worked an average of 36 hours a week for the last six weeks. So um, leading into this election, we have had to have more staffing. Um, in the fall election, we're looking at needing more people. That's our largest concern, cost of hiring and training new staff. We need to have direction now to know what we're going to be required to do. 
Are we having our polling places open? We paid for training and moving supplies and equipment to those polling locations, and then those polling locations were closed on the night before the election, and that cost us money that we couldn't use then on implementing the vote by mail process. We, our little small county whose budget is around 240,000, spent an additional 12,500 just on supplies, plus we figure another $2,000 on part-time help in addition to the pro bono help um, provided in overtime by myself and my deputy. Um, we need those extra dollars to make this a more smooth transition. We had only 20% turnout for our presidential presidential primary election. Normally that's a little low, but our county is different. Each county in the in the country is different. Some counties are small, some are large. Our demographics are different. We have a large Amish population. So they don't traditionally don't vote in a primary. This fall election, everybody's going to vote. We're going to have 80% turnout, and we're going to need the money for staffing for that. And budgets are now being cut. I know our county is a, a high tourist area, and our budgets are based mostly on sales tax. And I'm hearing this from the other small counties in our area, that their commissioners are already asking them to cut their budget. And we're looking at all these additional costs we're going to have to have for this general election, and we're being asked to cut our budgets by our commissioners, and this is something we cannot do. We need relief for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And operator, we're now ready for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star, then one on your touch tone phone. There will be a delay before the first question is announced. If you need speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one on your touch tone phone. And our first question comes from Nicole Goodkin from Fortune Magazine. Hi, thank you so much for, for uh, taking the time. I'm curious, you know, we're talking about how there's a need for more funding, but a lot of states have said they've had um, trouble accessing the first round of funding because of this 20% um, match necessity. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that at all. So this is Liz. The, the $400 million does rec include a requirement that states provide a 20% match. Um, and listening to state officials, that is um, – a burden in several states. And as you've heard on this call, um, there are concerns about local and state revenue. Um, you know, if, if Congress is willing to provide additional funding, we do not believe that, um, that the additional funding needs to include this match. Is anyone else, are there any people who work in particular states who've been having issues accessing this, this first round of funding because of that? So the state officials are, are responsible for requesting um, and obtaining the uh, funding from the federal government from the $400 million, and we have local election officials on the line with us today. All right, thank you. Uh, this is this is Ricky. I could uh, add just a little bit to that with Utah's matching funds. Uh, the lieutenant governor's office, who is the state elections director, and we work really well together. Um, they they came to us and they said we just don't think that we can ask the legislature for that 20% match. Fortunately, we had a little bit of money uh, available in um, unspent. Uh, presidential primary funds that they were able to use, but Utah really will probably claim about 50% of those federal funds because of that matching restriction. And our next question comes from Dominique Colton from Buzz. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you all for uh, doing this call today. Um, I am hearing these calls 
for more money. But I'm wondering, what do you see as being the scenario that plays out if this money doesn't come through? Do the counties run shortfalls? Or does the election simply fail to be administered on time? Can you sort of game out what the scenarios you see being if uh, this money doesn't happen? So this is Liz. I mean, and I'm absolutely happy to let the election officials talk to you about um, what they've seen in the past when um, budgets got really tight um, and and what they're concerned about if additional funding is not provided. This is Tina Barton speaking from Rochester Hills, Michigan. Uh, one of my concerns would be that um, the safety of my workers would um, be probably one of my largest concerns is how am I going to keep them safe if I don't have the funding to uh, buy the things that I need to protect them, to protect the voters in the precincts. And um, that would be one of my biggest concerns is that we will, if we don't have funding to help uh, secure and make these safe locations, um, what will end up happen happening um, to the voters and the workers who are working, and are we able to even get workers at that point, and um, what would we need to implement then to um, bring workers in? Does it become then where you bring in a National Guard? I mean, what happens in a scenario where you don't have election workers who feel that it is a safe situation. We have to have this funding. It isn't a matter of um, if they we can't get it. We have to have something in order to administer a safe election, not only for our, our um, constituents, but also for the workers who are literally putting themselves out there every single time that they, that they work an election. And we have to be there for them like they have been there for us. Thank you, Tina. Uh, uh, this is Ricky. I'll just add to that. If if the fun, um, election officials are really good at improvising, uh, we plan like crazy, but we are able to adjust our plans based off of the changing dynamics that always happen in the elections world. If funding doesn't come through, I think the biggest thing that uh, that uh, the public will see is long lines, uh, because uh, we'll either have to scale down the number of polling places that are available because we simply don't have the equipment and staffing, uh, or we'll have to scale down just simply the number of poll workers available and in use at the polling places. So no funding means long lines. And I think David well, also had a... Yeah, Liz, sorry about that. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other point in addition to the local election official point. You know, I think for folks in the media as well as folks on this call, we've been seeing that states have been, an increasing number of states have been using increasing amounts of their, right, 2018 and 2019 HAVA funds, right, in part to try and counter and respond to, right, some of the costs, right, that have arisen unexpectedly from the coronavirus. And so, you know, I think one of the real concerns, if there isn't additional funding, is not only about providing funds so that you can, right, among other things, keep your workers safe, right, and, and, and have a safe and secure election in the current environment, but, right, all the, I think a lot of the efforts that were made and have been made to try and secure our elections from foreign interference, right, might, might, might stall in some respects as well, um, because we need, there's a need for those funds too. Thanks, David. Our next question comes from Gabriella Novello from Who, What, Why. Hi, thanks so much for having this call. So my question is about in-person voting. Are, um, and maybe this is uh, mostly for election officials on the call. Um, are you taking into account what can be done to prevent long lines? I know that in Georgia, um, if you have to clean voting uh, Dominion voting machines, the voting machines have to be completely powered down first. So if you have to clean voting machines in between use, uh, what are you thinking about doing or implementing to make sure you're not having long lines starting to form? Uh, 
Um, this is Shane, Green County. Um, one of the things that we're looking at would be um, we have on Election Day central polling locations where rather than having to go to your signed polling location, you can go to one location and cast your ballot. Um, ideally, we would be able to have those opened up um, prior to the election. Uh, sometimes they're also referred to as vote centers. I know if you think of the Colorado model and Part of the goal is that, you know, as you begin to see more voters um, request an absentee ballot, of course, in our state, we're still looking to have the law potentially changed to be able to make that request easier on behalf of the voter. But clearly, there are a lot of voters who do want to vote in person. They don't necessarily want to cast their ballot um, through the mail um, system. And so that's one of the solutions we're looking at is allowing um central polling locations ahead of the day of the election, so that way on the day of the election, the lines um, will be um, reduced in terms of the election day turnout. And so I think you have to look at that as a, you know, you look at how many voters are going to vote by mail, how many would come and vote um, earlier than normal at, a, at, you know, identified central polling locations across your county. And then on the day of the election, of course, we'd have these signed polling locations in addition to the normal central polling locations that we have um, during Election Day. And so that would be the goal in terms of, you know, you just don't manage it on Election Day alone. You have to manage it well before the election in order to be sure that um, you try to create the best um, opportunity for the voter to be able to make that choice. And everything that I've seen is that voters want choices during this time period, and so if we have the opportunity to be able to give them those choices, um, it will make it a much better experience for the voter to be able to make the decision of what is best for them and their best interests as they go to be able to safely cast their vote and protect their health at the same time. Thank you, Shane. I think uh, Ricky also wanted to address this question. Uh, you bet. So uh, in Utah, as voters come to the polls, unless there is an ADA um, requirement that the voter cannot uh, cast their ballot on a paper independently. Um, we we issue what's called paper at the poll. So voters come in and we provide them with a, uh, a piece of paper that they fill out and then we can uh, have them scan that into one of our scanning machines uh, at the polling place. With this one, uh, with COVID-19, we are moving to a completely outdoor drive-through voting option. Uh, every county in the state uh, of Utah is required to either not have any in-person voting on election day or to have this uh, drive-through option. So we will provide um, functionality and, and a setup so that voters can come through and cast their ballot without even leaving their uh, vehicle. What this will involve is pre-printing uh, several thousand ballots, and then as voter comes up, come up and um, and show us their ID. We scan that. We print a voter label. Uh, that identifies them, and we put that on the outside of the envelope that has their ballot already inside it pre-printed, uh, and then they go and fill that out, uh, fill that ballot out in their car, and then they will go um, deposit their uh, voted envelope, uh, their voted ballot with the envelope and the label into one of our drop boxes that we have throughout the county. Uh, so. Um, that is, uh, and we surveyed the site. It's a pretty large outdoor site, but it's going to require help with our local sheriff and police department, uh, roads crews, uh, to make sure that it's safe and to make sure that as the lines start to back up that they aren't um, spilling out onto the streets. Um, it's a pretty interesting and complex process to try and get this so that uh, we can account for the, the rush that happens generally around 5, 5 or 6 p.m. Thank you, Ricky. Um, and I believe that Michelle also wanted to address this question. As you all know, we already did implement an all-male election absentee because of the COVID-19. So we were actually asked to have drop boxes in place within just a couple days of when the General Assembly passed that bill. So that was new to a lot of the counties in Ohio. So we have those drop boxes in place now that it was great, and they were actually surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in Ohio, it's a little different. We work in a bipartisan uh, fashion, so a Democrat and a Republican would each have to go open that box, 
and get the ballots out every time on election day. It was checked hourly. So again, imagine Cuyahoga County, who had probably approximately 14,000 ballots dropped off in that one day to have tabulated and have the results um, that night of the election. So again, with drop-off boxes, uh, safe uh, distancing, um, we were prepared with, um, you know, the antibacterial, the, uh, the wipes, the rovers to uh, clean things down. So uh, we are preparing and anticipating if this is still going to be or, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen in November. Thank you, Michelle. Just to remind um, just sir, and if you have a question, please press star one. And we also have Aaron Ackerman, who is the executive um, director of the Ohio Election Officials Association. Aaron, I didn't know if you had any additional comments. No, I just I think Michelle covered a lot of it. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, we uh, the good news is, you know, I think for the states that haven't had their election yet, we did do this in Ohio. We did have limited in-person voting, as Michelle mentioned. Uh, and so we did take those precautions that she had talked about. Um, you know, our, I think everyone's aware our governor and our secretary of state have been very aggressive on uh, the COVID response. And so we were, we felt very well prepared, but clearly, um, you know, safety uh, was our number one concern on, on election day for people that actually showed up. So we took all the precautions Michelle mentioned. Some counties set up tents outside. We were taking people's temperatures. Um, we were, you know, having social distancing uh, lines marked for people to stay six feet apart things like that, just all the common sense kind of precautions that everyone else is taking in the private sector, uh, we implemented here in Ohio as well. Thank you, Erin. And we have a question from Elizabeth Hardison from Pennsylvania Capitol. Hi, guys. Um, I'm a state government reporter here in Pennsylvania, and our state Senate today had a hearing about um, the election security issue and there's some reluctance among the Republican majority to issue paper ballots to um, all the voters in the state because, you know, they say that there are concerns about fraud. And so what I want to ask you is, um, like, you know, is there any evidence for widespread fraud in vote by mail um, and for other, for like local election officials? Um, you know, are there public kind of information campaigns the state could undertake to assuage concerns that might be misfounded. So um, we have a couple of people that uh, would like to respond to this question, and we're going to start with Paul Rosenweig from R Street. Okay, thank you. Hi, yeah, this is – hi. Um, yeah, there is, there is no such thing as a perfect election system. There's, there's likely to be errors and fraud and misconduct in person – by internet voting or vote by mail, the evidence of vote by mail fraud is painfully small, uh, virtually non-existent, and it almost always involves people who do a uh, ballot aggregation, who collect paper ballots from people and bundle them together and then deliver them, which was a, a case that actually happened. It was a Republican uh, incident in uh, North Carolina in, in, a, in, a, in an election cycle earlier this year. But I think that the right answer to to the uh, to the Republican um, uh, fear or the, the fears expressed by the Republican senators is that with good security systems, voting by mail is probably more as safe, if not safer, uh, than in-person voting in terms of fraud, anti-fraud, and it's certainly safer than any of the other options like internet voting. So that's really I would a uh, concern that ought not to uh, force uh, any citizens to put their lives at risk. Thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Tina Barton. Thank you, Liz. Um, this is actually something that uh, bothers me because I feel like it is um, kind of promoted even by politicians and parties uh, across the country, and I think it's done uh, without actual knowledge of how the system works. Uh, and so I think it's important, it was already noted earlier, that every single election official takes an oath of office, just like any other uh, elected official would do. 
So to insinuate that we are um, promoting or allowing or not taking uh, into consideration things that could be happening, I feel like is really an insult to election officials across the country. Um, I agree that I feel like absentee voting is actually um, has more security to it because in Michigan, every single, single voter has to fill out an application to obtain an absentee ballot. When they fill out that application, we scan that into our system, and, and that actually will pull up their driver's license signature. And we're looking at the signature on that application and matching that to their driver's license. If it doesn't match, they aren't getting a ballot from us. They're getting a letter from us and, and, a, and some sort of a contact from us telling them, hey, your signature's not matching. Once that's corrected, we then will send them a ballot. So once again, they have to sign the envelope that they're returning the ballot in, and a second time that signature is going through a check, again, against the driver's license, and if we find any discrepancies, again, we're not going to receive on that ballot. That ballot is actually going to be set aside until they can come in and cure it and make it right. So I feel like there are a lot of measures in place a lot of security in place. Um, that's why I'm a big proponent of paper ballots. If we ever need to go back and, and do an audit on that election to make sure that everything was counted correctly and done correctly, we can do so with paper ballots. But we have signatures in place. We're checking every single one of those for the last presidential election. My staff did over 26,000 signature checks to make sure that that person was exactly who they say they are. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Shane, I believe you wanted to comment. Yeah, and I just wanted to add on the point earlier, there is no perfect election in that um, certainly um, I'm a proponent of in-person voting um, because I think it's important. I think we always have to uh, be conscientious that, you know, it is possible that there may be people um, that would be in, you know, certain settings where if they were not able to vote in the light of day, where their vote could be coerced. However, um, I think the point that uh, was made earlier regarding the collection of ballots, um, one good thing about absentee voting is the paper trail that is created. Um, I often tell our legislators when I visit them here in Missouri that um, if election of fraud occurs on the day of the election, it is very unlikely that we will be able to catch it, um, assuming that the ballot is already put into um, the tabulation equipment that day. However, um, as we've had cases here in Missouri, um, we have been able to identify that someone was collecting on behalf of voters, and the prosecutors being able to take that evidence and prosecute that um, in, in certain instances. And so I think it's very important to realize that um, there is no perfect election system, and there will always be those who will try to defraud the outcome of the election. But it's important to realize that you do get a paper trail of absentee voting that you do not necessarily get on the day of the election um, that can help in terms of being able to um, protect the outcome of that election. Thank you, Shane. And I think that Ricky also wanted to comment on this question. Yes, just real quickly, uh, we often get concerns about rates of fraud and, and concerns and uh, we say, please, come and see. Come and observe our processes, how these ballots are collected and processed. And when they come in, I always say, please, think like a crook. Think like a crook. We want you to uh, find any holes that we may not have seen. Uh, we've hosted plenty of tours, tons of tours, including lots of skeptics who come through our office. And by far, the number one res response at the end is, wow, I had no idea that you took this much care and you had this much control uh, over your ballots, that you cared that much about every single ballot. One guy said, I worked at Boeing for 20 years. Your security is better than Boeing's as far as processing your ballot. So um, we, we want this to be an open process. We invite the public to come take a look. Like, let us talk to you. Let us show what, what we do and challenge us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're totally open to that. That helps us make the process better. Thank you, Ricky. And I think Shane had one more um, addition. I just wanted to add that, um, similar to Ohio, we have bipartisan teams that examine every, I think Tina mentioned in uh, Michigan as well, we have bipartisan teams here as well um, that examine every absentee ballot in the outside envelope that comes through. I think in terms of the signature verification, there's a very rigid process 
Um, and we have notarization here in our state as well. And even notarized ballots, we've had them come back without a signature, which causes us to scratch our head a little bit because that's the duty of the notary. Um, and those ballots cannot be accepted on behalf of that voter. So there are many safeguards put in place, and that's one of the things that I've been visiting with our members of the legislature is to let them know, because I think a lot of people think that because you have a notarized ballot, that means it's automatically accepted. Um, and I will say that as a very small percentage, it's not accepted, but nonetheless, um, the teams that we have that go through and examine each ballot, they take that duty very seriously and because they want to protect the integrity and the outcome of that election. And so um, I think that all of our election officials agree that the people that we are honored to work with alongside in terms of the people who are serving on the day of the election and those who are helping process the absentee ballot applications, um, they work diligently to make sure that everything um, is done in a fair manner that protects the integrity of the election. And so um, that that is one thing that uh, I learned very quickly as an election official is that uh, we get the honor to work with some of the best citizens in our counties that help make sure the election outcome is exactly as the voters um, cast their ballot on that day. Thank you so much, Shane. I think we're ready for the next question. Our next question comes from Benjamin Free from State School. Hi. Uh, thanks for um, doing this call. Um, I, I think, you know, this kind of touched upon uh, in the earlier comments, but um, one of the one of the one of the things that states have had to do in the primary uh, cycle, uh, if you know, in going to uh, entirely or you know, uh, almost entirely uh, absentee voting is really extend the absentee period. Um, I think, um, you know, Ohio, the folks in Ohio, you, you added about, you know, close to six weeks. Uh, uh, I know the, the, the Ohio, in Iowa, they are, they extended their absentee period to 40 days, but in, in a general election, if, and especially if you, if you are going to have turnout, uh, approaching 65, 70, uh, percent or higher, uh, do you, is there any sense of how far out in advance you would need to send those ballots, send, send those absentee ballots, uh, to people, uh, to people? Um, you know, how, uh, how early, how, how early would you have to, would, would the, uh, voting process begin and, um, does that add to the, the financial and time crunch that, that all, that, that, uh, voting officials are in? So, Michelle or Lisa, I know you've just been through this, and you were um, more on the back end where <clears throat> absentee voting got extended. Um, but I don't know if either of you or any of the other election officials on the call wanted to address this. I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had time to do the mailing. However, I don't feel the voters – had the time to get it back. Um, but I think part of ours was misinformation. What we traditionally do is a 28-day um, voting period from the end of our voter registration until Election Day, and the actual vote-by-mail deadline is normally Saturday. What we did this time, it had been extended. The Saturday was actually last Saturday, um, we had to have all of our requests received by noon, and we managed to process everything that we got in. However, we did not have a huge turnout. I think that if we know ahead of time we're pushing that, we would have more staff on hand. We'd be able to even do more. And I think that 30-day window is enough, but I think the people need the education to know you need to request your ballot early in that period so you have time to get the ballot, the first the request to us, the ballot back to you through the Postal Service, and then get the ballot back to us. We were facing three to five days um, post service. So that is something that needs to be taken into consideration. I do believe 30 days is enough, um, plenty, if, if people are willing to request early. Thank you. And Erin, I think you had um, a follow-up comment. Yeah, this is uh, Aaron Ackerman again from Ohio, and I appreciate Lisa's clarification on that. I, I think my answer would be, you know, 
we should probably look to the five states that do all mail voting and maybe take some lessons there. Uh, with each state kind of doing this differently, I think a large part of it, and Lisa touched on this, is what your process is going to be. So in Ohio, you know, what we did for this last April 28th election was uh, voters were notified of their ability to request an absentee ballot, which then triggered a mailing to the Board of Elections requesting an absentee ba- uh, ballot, which then triggered us to mail the ballot to the voter, and then they, of course, had to mail that back. And like Lisa said, with all those um, various steps back and forth between the voter and the Board of Elections, you know, at least three separate times we, we uh, relied on the Postal Service to, to move that mail back and forth. It did create a very compressed timeline. I know some states just mail ballots directly to their voters. So clearly in those instances, when you're uh, cutting out several steps in the process, you can probably have a more aggressive timetable. Um, but our experience in Ohio was that um, despite the valiant efforts of the men and women at the U.S. Postal Service, we just, you know, we were very, very short on time because of those multiple steps involved in, in the way we chose to, to run our election here. So I think that's maybe a lesson that other states who are looking at this can learn from. Um, you know, your, your laws and regulations have to um, comport and fit within the time frames that you set. Thanks so much, Aaron. And I think, you know, Ricky has, has a lot of experience here and um, may want to um, include some comments. Uh, you bet. So Weber County has been doing vote-by-mail elections since 2013. That was our first one. We started out with uh, three weeks mailing out ballots to voters three weeks prior to Election Day. Uh, uh, we experimented one time with four weeks, and we found that many voters actually would come in on Election Day forgetting that they had already voted. Um, now, of course, we our controls catch that, but uh, we found that four weeks was actually a little bit too long. Our return pattern, whether it was three weeks or four weeks, generally you get about 30% of your ballots back in the very first week uh, after mailing them out. And then uh, over the next week, two, or three, whatever it is, you only get about 20% of your ballots back. And then about 50% of your ballots come in the last two to three days uh, uh, coming up to Election Day. And we found that whether it was three weeks or four weeks, that pattern still still held uh, I think it's important, as was mentioned earlier, to be mindful of those voters who are, uh, are more remote and uh, Postal Service takes a bit more time to get out to them. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, we're hammering this with our voters. You've got to vote early. And if you haven't received your ballot, give us a call. Um, uh, federal law prohibits um, election mail, uh, official election mail, to be forwarded, um, the ballots. And so the Postal Service can't do that. And uh, so you want to do it early uh, and get involved as quickly as you can, so that you don't avoid, the, so you can avoid the last-minute rush and the, and the challenges that come if you wait too long. Thanks so much, Ricky. Um, and thanks so much to our all of our election officials and all of our co-authors for joining today, and for everyone else um, for joining us on this call. Uh, the press contact information for everyone who spoke on the call today is included in the call invitation. And if there are any broader questions about the call, please reach out to my Brennan Center colleague, Becca Autry, at Rebecca.Autry, which is spelled A-U-T-R-E-Y, at NYU.edu. Again, that's Rebecca.Autry at NYU.edu. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.